Hi guys, so welcome to our next session of Zach decision making. In today's session, we'll be looking at uh, approximately four different case lists. So we'll try to identify the problems. We'll also try to take you through the thought process involved in taking the decisions. So pay careful attention and start learning how to approach these questions in a very easy manner. Right, so let's start with the first set. Now this set says that there's a Bharat Business School, a Premier B School, uh, was renowned for the quality education it provided. So note on a few important terms, okay? Whenever I see a few terms, I start noting them down. So the quality education is very important. Its faculty is known for their domain area expertise and excellence in teaching, okay? And compared with each other for better student feedback. That means this college is very much known for its teaching quality and student feedback, okay? Of late, the, institu the institution was finding it difficult to upgrade its course content with rapidly changing business scenario. Which means, this is a challenge that we are facing, that you know, we have to make courses with a rapidly changing business scenario and the institute is finding it difficult. So I can also bring in, as bring in an assumption here that uh, the existing faculties were not so either did not have enough time to make the courses or were not so competent enough in making the courses, right? This can be a few assumptions that we can have in our mind, right? So which means they need some extra extra help for sure, okay? The difficulty is multiplied when the school realized that some senior faculty would retire on a regular basis in starting in the near future, okay? That means some of the faculties are also retiring. So to overcome these difficulties, BBS decided to recruit young faculty in all the departments, okay? When the Dean Academic scanned the application, she found three distinct types of aspirants. A type candidates who were very good at teachers, who were very good teachers and competent in teaching the courses which are taught by the existing faculties. Now this is one of the good points because you observe that when the B school is known for its excellence in teaching and they're getting very good teachers, right? Now that becomes a very easy thing for us to replace. But we need to also understand there's one more challenge that we have to make courses, right? We, we, you know, which are, uh, ec uh, which are acclimatizing or which are accommodating the changing global scenarios, right? Now let's see. Uh, B type candidates who were average teachers, okay? So they were average teachers, but they were competent in creating new courses and would that would complement the existing courses taught by the current faculty. So these are the guys who are also competent enough in making some courses, but they're average teachers. Now this is where the institute has to strike a balance, okay? Now C type candidates were not so good teachers willing to teach any course that BBS required, okay? So if I were the decision maker, the C type would not be the most preferred type because one, they are not able to create a course. They are willing to teach any course. At the same time, they are not so good teachers, whereas my teaching qualities are very high. Right, so <coughs> now this is where we are also looking at. Now, uh, now note one is say, says a course is termed complementary when it covers latest contents and complements existing courses offered by a department, okay? And note two is each department decides the suite of the courses to be offered, right? So given the above context, which of the following options will be the best recruitment decision for BBS? Now let's try to understand the challenges. The challenges are that my existing faculties, right, are finding it difficult to upgrade the course with a rapidly changing scenario. That means we need to definitely uh, add a few courses to our syllabus, right? At the same time, we also need to ensure that the quality of teaching is not compromised because that is where we are very good at. Clear? So if I want to look at the best recruitment decision, right, it, it should obviously balance both of them. I should try to bring a balance between a uh, teaching quality at the same time, something which can bring in additional courses, right? So let's go through options and let's try to see which option is working and what is happening here. So hire B type candidates so that all types of courses can be offered to students. On the face value, it sounds good, but we need to understand that in terms of teaching, quality, they are average teachers, okay? So they are average teachers, which is also a good plus, right? With the fact that they are also able to create complementary courses because they are competent enough to make complementary courses. So option A seems a little close, but let's not right away jump, jump down to conclusions. 
let's look at option b don't recruit and re then request the existing faculty to develop complementary courses now let's be very practical this is definitely not going to be my option because one i know that the existing faculties are finding it difficult right which means they need some additional help for sure and two we also know that the faculties are retiring that means there is definitely a need for extra faculties to be bring to, to be brought in so if i'm not recruiting at all then that would definitely add to the extra load of the existing faculty which might again come up as a resistance from the ex existing faculty or which might eventually affect their workload okay higher c type candidates as they can teach any course now for higher c type candidates the only problem here is the quality of teaching will be affected because i know that quality or the type c candidates are not so good teachers right so if i align with my vision that we are known for our best feedback so if i have certain existing faculties who have great feedback and i bring in certain type c faculties who are not at all very good at teaching right there will be a clear discrimination among the in the quality in the eyes of students which will again lead to a bad feedback right or a mixed feedback which will definitely affect the institute in the future right so option c also is definitely not my answer now hire type a candidates unconditionally and allow them to teach courses taught by existing faculty now i cannot hire type a faculties unconditionally <coughs> So what is the advantage of type A faculties? The advantage of type A faculties is that they are very good teachers. But if I hire them unconditionally, I'm not addressing my second challenge, the challenge of making complementary courses and also teaching them. Right, and it's also clearly, this option is also clearly talking about allow them to teach courses taught by the existing faculty, which means this option is not at all talking about complementary courses or the need to upgrade the courses with a rapidly changing business scenario so option d also definitely does not solve all the problems let's look at option e now hire a type faculties on a condition that they will develop complementary courses now this is where i think is striking the best balance as if i compare with option a and option e let's be very practical here option a has only one problem it's it's not solving one of the problems it's solving the other problem that or type B faculties can make complementary courses. So it is definitely solving the complementary courses problem, right? But type B faculties are average teachers. So that is where I'm not able to align with my existing vision of quality teaching. Whereas if I look at option E and I put a condition that they have to develop complementary courses, which means the institution is also being able to make complementary courses. At the same time, if they hire type A faculties, the quality of education is also not being compromised because they are definitely very good teachers, right? So therefore, according to me, if I were to choose between option A and option E, I would obviously go with option E as my most, you know, the best recruitment decision for this college at this point in time. Clear? So this is how the decision has to be taken, guys. You need to understand that both the or all the problems or all the conditions are to be kept clearly in your mind and while taking any decision we should not involve any personal bias we should stick to the problems that we have and then you know think of the best possible solution in that case right now let's look at the second question here now i'm told that suppose the dean academics wanted to reduce future conflicts and political maneuvering to ensure harmony amongst faculty right so if i were to reduce this it, and it's obviously a case because if every faculty is competing against each other there would definitely be certain conflicts at the same time some politics which would be involved right because everybody is willing to prove that their course is the best right so somewhere the institute also should not be losing the vision so which of the following options will best reduce the conflicts and politicking amongst the faculty okay let's look at it now hire b type candidates to teach complementary courses right now let's let's try to understand what is happening here so if existing faculties are already there okay if existing faculties are already there and teaching existing courses right and if i suddenly bring some newcomers and also ask them to teach the existing courses there will definitely be some politicking that will happen clear so the best possible solution here that would be is that i bring some new faculties 
to teach some new courses which will not create a problem so in that case option a sounds the best option hire b type candidates to teach complementary courses only so they will be they are competent in making those courses and since they are average teachers i'm sure in the complementary courses area there will not be too much of a problem so let's keep option a on hold let's go to option b hire c type candidates and allow them to teach all types of courses now there are two problems in this one type c faculties are definitely not good teachers right so hiring type c candidates is definitely out of the scope at this moment right and allowing them to teach all the types of courses will again create a problem right reason being that as i told you since existing faculties are already taking their courses with a very good feedback if type c faculties will also take the all the types of courses which the existing faculty is also taking there will definitely be a future conflict among the students as well as among the faculty as well so option b is definitely not going to be our answer let's go to option c hire type a candidates to teach existing courses and ask the existing faculty to teach new courses now there will definitely be a resistance from the existing faculties right because the existing faculties are already comfortable in taking their own courses and suddenly new faculties are brought in to teach their courses right and the existing faculties are asked to teach new courses now this will definitely include in, you know in, in increase the future conflicts and would involve a lot of issues right which will break the harmony amongst the faculty so option c is definitely not going to be my answer now hire type a candidates and let the new as well as existing faculties offer the same courses now again the same problem that will happen here if my existing faculties are offering the courses and if i allow the new faculties also to offer the same courses now that is a point where i'll have a huge problem and you know the conflicts among the faculties will increase and at the end of the day the students will you know will be the ones to suffer or the quality will be suffering at the end so bringing in type a and uh, asking them to you know uh take the courses along with the existing faculties will definitely involve some kind of conflicts for sure hire type b candidates and uh, again ask them to teach all kinds of courses so according to me to make this question very simple i think as i told you the solution would be very simple that if existing faculties are teaching existing courses clear right so they will let them take the existing courses so i'm not disturbing the existing scenario and if i'm hiring new faculties the easier thing would be is ask the new courses to be taken by the new faculties right so anywhere if i'm talking about all types of courses or the existing courses the existing faculty does not become a rightful option because that will definitely include increase the future conflicts among the faculty so therefore in this case i think option a becomes the best option where i'm hiring b b type faculties who are competent in making complementary courses and asking them only to teach complementary courses so there won't be any competition with the existing faculties neither would the ego of the existing faculties will get affected so in that case i think the option a becomes the best option to reduce the conflicts and politicking among the faculty right let's look at the next option here next question here now suppose the dean academics wanted to ensure the most efficient utilization of faculty resources which of the following hiring decisions will ensure the most efficient utilization of faculty resources now so i want to utilize them in the most efficient manner right so let's look at the options now hire type a candidates and let the new as well as existing faculty to teach same courses now first of all this is not talking about complementary courses it's only talking about same courses right so if i bring in type a and the faculties or to teach the existing faculty to teach the same courses definitely it won't be the most effici efficient utilization because i'm not talking about who will teach the complementary courses and there will be a lot of you know interlinking of if of utilization which will happen among the existing faculties and type a faculty so option a does not become the correct option right now now hire b type candidates to teach complementary courses now this is an option that we can think of right to teach complementary courses here so we can hold option b here ask existing faculty to develop complementary courses now if i just ask my existing faculty to develop complementary courses this will not be an efficient utilization of resources because existing faculties are already taking certain courses 
right? So putting them with an additional responsibility might overutilize them and at the end of the day, which might definitely affect the classroom feedback. So asking just the existing faculty to develop complementary courses without additional help does not become a rightful option here. So therefore option C is definitely out of question. Now hire C type candidates and assign them teaching assistant responsibilities. Now first of all, I do not, I'm clearly told that C type are not so good teachers. So I'm not sure that they would be good at teaching assistant responsibilities, right? At the same time, this might also affect the feedback. So therefore this is definitely not efficient utilization of resources. And if you look at option E, it says hire type A candidates capable of developing complementary courses. So here we need to see that if I look at option E here, so hiring type A candidates capable of developing complementary courses. And if I compare with option B, we're hiring type B candidates to teach complementary courses, especially in terms of efficient utilization of faculties. Now, what is the problem here? Now, obviously we see that if type A candidates are able to develop complementary courses, I am able to bring a balance between the teaching quality, okay? As well as I'm able to introduce complementary courses. Whereas if I go with option B, the only reason where option B becomes a slightly lesser preferred option is that type B candidates are average faculties, right? Since type B candidates are average faculty, so option B further gets reduced and compared to option B, option E becomes the final answer in this case. And that is going to be our final answer. So you see guys, if you keep the points in mind that which are the problems that we have to handle and what are the things that we have to keep in mind to not disturb the existing setup that makes our job pretty easy rather than going ahead and you know taking some decisions based on the personal biased uh, biasness altogether right so let's look at the next set here now i'm told that in this set i'm talking about arthi the ceo of an fmcg company was under the pressure from the board of governors to increase diversity of diversity in the workforce okay the board wanted the company to hire the candidates with vision impairment as it believed that they can, they contributed to organizations in many unique ways. Okay. So they believe that the vision impairment candidates can contribute in many unique ways. Okay. Let's come down to that. The CEO was apprehensive of hiring visually impaired candidates because she was not sure about the feasibility of accommodating them in the current setting. So how will I bring them in the current setting? Moreover, Arthi was unsure as to how visually impaired, okay, could contribute meaningfully to the organization. Okay. So a person with vision impairment in a range of 60 to hundred percent is referred to as a visually impaired person. A person with hundred percent is cannot see at all. Okay. The following arguments were presented to Arthi about the candidates with vision impairment. So I'm told that visually impaired candidates can do some activities. Okay, we'll come back to the arguments later. From the above arguments, which of the following options indicates that CEO's apprehensions are misplaced? What is the apprehension of the CEO? Let's be very objective. The apprehension of CEO is that these guys might not be able to contribute meaningfully to the organization. And the second apprehension was she was not sure about the feasibility of accommodating, accommodating them in the current setup. Right. And if I want these apprehensions to be misplaced, that means I want to look at the arguments which are in favor of the visually impaired candidates. Because according to me or according to the scenario, CEO right now is in a no, no situation for the visually impaired candidates. So if I want the options to indicate CEO's apprehensions to be misplaced, Right. So that means I need to talk about the options or the arguments which are favoring the visually impaired candidates. Now let's look at the arguments. Visually impaired can do some activities better than the normal people and helps complement other employees. Yes, this is definitely in favor of visually impaired candidates and also misplacing CEO's apprehension or helping CEO to understand that they can complement other employees. Visually impaired can motivate other employees to work harder. This is also positively affecting the company. And this is also talking about the meaningful contribution from the visually impaired candidates. Okay. Visually impaired can act as a role model model for other disadvantaged people in the society. Yes, this is also a positive side because this definitely comes up as a meaningful contribution to the, you know, workplace. 
right as well as to the society outside so hiring visually impaired candidates will definitely act as a positive setup here wherein the ceo is apprehensive about it visually impaired can work harder to prove themselves so if i have the proof that they can work harder than the others then they can definitely contribute to the uh, to the organization here so option 4 is also in favor of visually impaired candidates hiring visually impaired people may enhance organizational reputation which may consequently lead to better sales this is also counter arguing ceo's apprehension saying that if we hire them definitely we are going to be in benefit clear and option 6 says visually impaired have to be paid 20% extra salary now this is aligning with the ceo's apprehension because ceo is already apprehensive that how will i accommodate them in the current setup right and if i have to accommodate them in the current setup along with an increment of their salary right then that definitely becomes a cause to worry right so option 6 is directly supporting ceo's apprehension or it is against the visually impaired candidates right so if you observe all the arguments from 1 to 5 are in favor of visually impaired people right which are clearly misplacing ceo's apprehension so therefore my answer becomes option a which is argument 1 2 3 4 5 all these are in the in align with ceo's apprehensions clear so let's move to the next question here now i'm told that arthi wanted to follow the suggestion given by the board which means arthi wants now to include the uh, visually impaired people in the workforce however she was not sure if the company was ready to accommodate candidates with 100% vision okay maybe infrastructural right let's understand that also the concern involving such employees in meaningful activities was constantly bothering her she was still worried that if they will be able to contribute meaningfully to the organization hence she constituted a committee to come up with recommend uh, with recommendations that would help the company in hiring 100% visually impaired employees okay now after 2 months of deliberations the company came up with the following recommendations hire visually impaired candidates uh, unconditionally okay we'll come back to that now let's look at the question statement first which of the following options will best allay concerns as well as be fair to all the stakeholders when i say allay allay means to reduce right so that means which of the following will reduce the concerns what is the what is the uh, you know concern here that if the company will be able to accommodate or if the company was ready to accommodate 100% impaired people and point number 2 will such people be involved in meaningful activities so these are two concerns that we have to reduce from the options right and then see that it will also be fair to all the stakeholders now let's look at option 1 hire visually impaired candidate employees unconditionally as it is company's social responsibility now this will not avoid the concern of such employees in meaningful activities if i just hire them unconditionally i might end up in you know hiring certain candidates which might not contribute to my organization so therefore is this reducing the concern no this is definitely not reducing the concern so i cannot unconditionally hire visually impaired candidates now option 2 uh point 2 hire visually impaired employees in activities they can contribute yes this is a very valid recommendation to reduce the concern that only if they can contribute to certain activities then hire visually impaired candidates okay ensure a visually impaired friendly office space food courts restrooms parking etc now this is also very valid uh you know uh, recommendation given by the committee because if the company has to bring in visually impaired people then the office also has to be a visually impaired friendly office right so this option is to this recommendation is talking about making the office ready for such people so this is definitely a concern that will reduce uh, this will definitely an option that will reduce the concerns now point number 4 says allow guide dogs to assist employees with 100% vision impairment in the office premises even this is resolving one of the concerns that are we infrastructurally ready or are we ready so if i have guide dogs to assist such employees right in that case also i'll be able to help the ceo in implementing the decision of the board of governors right so we see that option 1 or uh, so point 1 is not valid 
whereas point 2, 3 and 4 are valid. So if you look at option B, option B is talking about point 2, 3 and 4 and therefore option B becomes a perfect choice. Right? Now let's look at the next question here. Now Suresh refuses to be served coffee by visually impaired baristas. Okay? But he does believe in donating to the visually impaired. Okay? So he does not want to be served but he was willing to donate them, donate for them. The following statements could explain why Suresh does not want to be served by visually impaired baristas. Okay, we'll skip the points. Now let's go to the question statement. From the following, choose the best, choose the option that best explains Suresh's biased behavior. So I need to choose those statements which are validating Suresh's bi biased uh, behavior, right? So let's look at statement one. He thinks that visually impaired are inefficient to serving coffee or at serving coffee. Uh, I think this is definitely explaining his biased behavior just because he is thinking that they are inefficient to serve coffee. He is not willing to be served coffee by visually impaired people. So this is definitely explaining his biased behavior. So statement one is definitely into our consideration. Now his parents have taught him to donate instead of accepting services from challenged individuals. Now this is also if you look at individually the way he is being brought up that he doesn't want to be accepting, he, do, he doesn't want to accept services from the challenge people whereas he wants to donate and help them, right? So therefore, this also can be a very valid statement uh, to look at Suresh's bi bi biased behavior, right? He believes that his refusal to be served will have adverse consequences. Now, this has no nothing to do with the existing scenario, right? Or to explain with his biased behavior. So therefore, option 3 is definitely not working in that case. Now he feels joyous amongst visually impaired, sharing his life and caring for them. Now this is completely contradicting from his biased behavior. Right? When he's feeling joyous among them, sharing his life and caring for them, then there should not be any problem for him to also accept coffee from visually impaired barista. So therefore, option 4 also does not, you know, uh, explain Suresh's bi biased behavior. Right? So if you look at from the given statement, statement 1 and statement 2 are clearly explaining his biased behavior. So therefore, if I look at my options, option D definitely talks about 1 and 2 only. So therefore, that is going to be our required answer. Clear guys, so I hope you are able to understand. You have to objectively keep certain things in your mind and then go through the options carefully to reject the options which are, you know, not serving our cause and then choose carefully the ones that are serving our cause. Right, so let's look at one more set here. Now this set is talking about uh, during the floods of 2018-2019, a group of philanthropists led by Nia Budin wished to open a free food center for the needy. Okay, their motto was that no human should be hungry. Okay, so this was their complete motto: no human should be hungry. And they wanted a food center for the needy. Okay. Nothing gives more satisfaction to the philanthropist than to see hungry eat to the fullest. So these are certain important points to note. Now post COVID-19, the group started a food center by the name of Win Born Life Care Food in a small town called Palakkad. The center started gaining popularity as the number of people enjoying free meals increased over a period of time. Okay. Initially, WLCF offered a standardized menu consisting idli, opma, puttu for breakfast, curd rice for lunch and idli or opma for supper. Six women were employed. So I have some people who were employed and it's a philanthropist or philanthropic center to prepare all the meals. As the number of diners increased, they started expecting a variety in the menu. All WLCF at WLCF. Uh, WBLCF, not all the diners eat free while two thirds get free food, one third would donate the amount to the to a transparent charity box kept at the entrance. So, wow. so for example, a man donated rupees 500 after consuming two idlis and a woman approached Niyabuddin and inquired of about donating 10 kgs of rice. Okay, that's beautiful. So, those who could not afford to donate were seen prostrating worshipfully in front of the charity box. Okay. Some caring individuals made monetary donation while others donated rice, fruits and vegetables to WBLCF. Further, the center received inquiries from many locals on how they could contribute to the cause. That means this was gaining popularity. Now out of that popularity, some people started contributing and donating and that was helping them to run the show. 
as the center was lauded for its philanthropic work by the town by the people of town niyabuddin intended to replicate the initiative in nearby districts however he is concerned about the cost that goes in to the running the center obviously right almost 75% of the donated amount goes into buying the cooking in ingredients while the rest goes in paying salaries operations and maintenance costs so if i look at any philanthropic center like this we will definitely be considered about the cost factor to run the center because it should be self sustainable to run the center right so from the following options choose the most important challenge that niyabuddin has to overcome to sustain wbl cf this is a very easy question in this set guys because we know it's very clearly told that the cost that goes into running the center is the most important thing that a person has to take care of while running such center so if i want to sustain wbl cf i need to first look at the cost that is involved right so let's understand option a says getting enough finances and donations definitely becomes the most important challenge right now let's look at option b paying salaries to employees now this is important but let's understand option a is the most important once i get finances from finances i'll obviously pay salaries to the employees because only paying salaries is not the concern we need to also understand that 75% of the amount goes into buying cooking ingredients so option b is a subset of option a if i have enough money right i will be definitely able to afford for the ingredients and also paying salaries to the employees so option b is not the most important challenge it is definitely one of the challenges attracting enough diners is again a subset clear of the first option having enough cooks and employees again that will only happen if i have enough finances and donations so it is important but not the most important preparing only local dishes for diners is definitely not going to be the most important challenge here as we discussed that the most important challenge in challenge in running a philanthropic center or a philanthropist center is managing finances and donations so therefore option a becomes a correct answer in this case now let's look at this so <coughs> almost everything the like thing that is mentioned on the left was already that we have already gone through right now let's look at the question statement on the right now niyabuddin Nayabud, realized that some days on some days the food was wasted while on the other days diners went back hungry now this is definitely a challenge when anything involved food is considered so he sought an advice from a consultant friend on how to reduce wastage the consultant suggested the following okay so i have five statements we'll come back to that which of the above ideas will not be consistent with the core ethos of wblcf now what is the core ethos of wblcf that it is a food center for the needy no human should be hungry and the ethos was also to see that the hungry eat to the fullest so these are the three major ethical principles on which the center was set up right so if anything is attacking these three things is going to be the most important thing which will not be inconsistent of the ethical dilemma right so let's look at statement 1 launch a mobile app so that diners can pre inform their arrival to wbl cf this is solving the problem of wastage this is also in line with the ethics of wbl cf because right now their target is to reduce the wastage and there is informing mobile they is launching a mobile app to inform the diners so that the diners can pre inform so not a problem here this is not inconsistent this is not consistent this is definitely consistent with the ethos of wblcf ask diners to who enjoy free meal to distribute excess food to the hungry on the streets again this is in line with the main motive that okay people who are eating free meals please most welcome and eat and if there is any extra food left please donate it to the people on the streets no problem now ask diners to eat less as it is good for health now please understand this is definitely not consistent with the ethics or the main ethos of wbl cf because this was a food center for needy in a food center for needy where you want to serve hungry people you can't ask them to eat less because you do not know right how much are hungry they are or you can't ask them to eat less because they are hungry and your main job is to make sure that nobody is going hungry again preach people to eat less so anything with respect to eating less will definitely be you know will definitely not be consistent with the core ethos of wblcf so option 4 is also definitely going to be our answer 
and ration amount of food to be served to the diners again you cannot do this when you are a philanthropic center and you want to serve the needy people so statement 3 statement 4 statement 5 these four ideas or these three ideas are not consistent with the ethos of WBLCF and therefore my answer here becomes option B. Clear? Let's look at one more question here. Now Niyabuddin wanted to conserve local recipes that can be used to prepare mouth smacking dishes for the diners. Okay. Which of the following could be the best way to conserve local recipes? So I want to conserve local recipes. Okay. Now let's look at the option A. Uh, hold a weekly competition from the best local dish for the best local dish and get it judged and documented by the local volunteers. Now, I have a local center, so I want to make local dishes and I want to conserve local recipes, right? So the best way, I think option A right now seems to be the best because I hold a weekly competition for the best local dish. People come, we judge them and then we also document it by the local volunteers so that we will be able to conserve the local recipes. So option A seems to be correct because it's involving community also judged by the local judged by the community only. Right. So I think uh, this is more or less uh, in line with the existing situation that we have. Request a lady once a week in Palakkad to cook food at WBLCF on a voluntary basis and document the recipes. Now that might not be the best recipe liked by all. Right. If I w as compared to option A. So I would clearly see that as compared to option A, option B becomes slightly weaker because option A is giving me a competition for the best local dish, right? And also is being judged by the local volunteers, right? So that in that case versus requesting a lady randomly to come and uh, cook on a voluntary basis might not involve mouth smacking dishes for the diners, right? Tie up with one of the food delivery partners to help them document the recipes. Now food delivery partners, they will be busy in delivering food, right? At the same time, we might not be able to come up with the best local recipe here. So option C again becomes weaker as compared to option A. Tie up with a chef of the best restaurant in the Palakkad to document recipes. Now this also is right that you tie up, but let's be very clear when I tie up with a chef of the best rest restaurant, it involves cost and the best restaurant that the chef at the best restaurant might be able to make recipes but that might not be the best recipe in the uh, best recipe that might be liked by the volunteers because let's be clear when i talk about the best restaurant right the kind of people going to the best restaurant will be very different as compared to the kind of people who will be going to the philanthropic center so tying up with the chef of the best restaurant has a lot of concerns so i still believe that option a is a very open option and which is giving the best solutions. Let's look at option E. Ask free diners to contribute one recipe for a dish and give them the responsibility to document it. Now again, we want the best recipe. So this also becomes slightly weaker as compared to option A because according to me, if I look at option A, I am holding a weekly competition and that is being judged by the local volunteers. So that is still a stronger way to make sure that you get the best and the local recipes and you're also able to conserve them, right? So therefore option A becomes the correct answer for this question and uh, this completes our set, right? Now let's go to another set here. Now there's a very beautiful set which was uh, about the latest practices which are happening in the IT industry. Moonlighting is a practice for one organization while also accepting additional responsibilities and jobs typically without the employer's knowledge in another organization, okay? It is named as such because it is typically performed at night or on weekends. Doing two remote jobs at once was already happening. It was the biggest open secret out there in the tech, said a US techie. Okay. Due to weaker margins, major IT companies such as Infosys, TCS and Wipro announced that they would delay, postpone or reduce variable payout to employees for the first quarter of fiscal year 2023. This drew attention to moonlighting. The Indian IT industry was divided on the issue of moonlighting. Some considered it unethical while others viewed it as an urgent necessity. Infozeta chairman Patrick's stance on this matter was crystal clear. There is a great deal of talk about people working part time in the tech industry. This is cheating, pure and simple, he had tweeted. Okay. However, Macmillan, CEO of Beta Universe, does not consider moonlighting as cheating. Employment is a contract between an employer who pays me for working n number of hours per day, he explained. Now, 
what I do after that time is entirely upon up to me. I can do whatever I please. Okay. So there are mixed reviews about moonlighting. So moonlighting is nothing but taking up two jobs at the same time and the other employer is not aware of it. Right. Now let's look at the question statement. Which of the following options will have least negative consequence? Least negative consequence on moonlighting employee. Now what, what are the challenges of moonlighting that you have to work for extra hours? In the second job as well as the first job, right? So that is one of the major challenges of moonlighting employees, right? And uh, I want to have the least negative consequence. Okay, let's see. So employer reducing daily working hours from eight hours to six hours. Now this will have a negative consequence called the salary might reduce as per this statement. If I'm working for n number of hours per day, if I'm paid some extra rupees as salary, and if I'm reducing the number of hours right which will definitely reduce my salary from the first job on one side but the positive is that it is giving more time for the moonlighting employees to work on the second job so therefore if you observe more or less it will not have any impact on the moonlighting employees or it will have a very less impact on the moonlighting employees because I'm reducing the number of hours so a moonlighting employee can involve or can engage himself for the same number of hours in some other job right and will definitely make more money from there so making a little less here and making a little more there I think is more or less balancing it out so according to me this sounds to be a very less negatively con negative consequence on moonlighting employees okay let's look at statement B option B uh, increased family problems because employees will not be able to spend quality time at home. Of course, yes, this will definitely increase family problems. So as compared to option one, this will definitely be having a higher consequence as compared to option A. Poor physical health of employees because of excess work is again supporting the, you know, the challenges of moonlighting employees since they have to work more, they will, their health will definitely get affected so this is a definitely negative consequence for a moonlighting employee employers employees performance may be adversely affected because of overworking yes this will also be a negative consequence on moonlighting employees and that will have a major impact because my performance is you know adversely affected which might also affect my appraisal it might also affect my salary in future also affect my promotion in future so this will definitely have a larger negative consequence on moonlighting employees right employer reducing salaries because of moonlighting again if I'm reducing direct salaries because of moonlighting and not increasing reducing the number of hours look at it option A and option E the problem with option E is the employer is not reducing the number of hours but the employer is reducing the salaries right so again option E as compared to option A will definitely have a higher negative consequence on moonlighting employees so therefore if I look at all the five options I can see that option A is giving a bit of extra liberty to the employees by reducing the number of hours even if they reduce the pay a bit should not be a problem so therefore option A becomes the least negative consequence on moonlighting employees right let's look at the next question now Mr. Q is an IT professional who works for a small company in Bangalore his office hours are from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. thus he wants to utilize his morning time he thought of taking up extra work, however, he is not sure about the righteousness of his decision. His company does not have a clear policy on moonlighting as he is confused. He seeks opinions of people who work in his industry to understand ethical dimension of moonlighting. So he is considering the ethical dimension. Okay. The following opinions are shared with Mr. Q. Okay. Let's look at the question statement. Given the above mentioned opinions, which of the following combinations will best help Mr. Q realized that moonlighting is ethical. Okay, let's look at it. Option 1 says moonlighting is unacceptable since the employer has a complete right over the employee. This is nowhere talking about the an unethical stance of moonlighting. Let's be very clear. It is rather talking about the right of employer over the employee. Right, but somewhere it is telling that okay, moonlighting is not acceptable. Right. So let's, so op opinion one according to me is definitely not going to make him realize that it is unethical. It is just saying that it is talking about employer's right over the employee. 
Moonlighting is the charge of the employee and that the employer has no authority over the employee's conduct after the office hours. Again, this is not going to help him because this is in a way promoting that moonlighting is okay. You can do moonlighting whereas Mr. Q has to realize that moonlighting is definitely going to be unethical. So that is something which is very important. Clear? Op opinion 3 says moonlighting leads to employee missing out on important organizational work. Yes, this might make him believe that it is unethical because I, if I'm missing out on important organizational work that is not expected of me as an employee and definitely that will be unethical there. Okay. So while moonlighting, the employee might unknowingly leak critical information gained from one organization to the other. This is also unethical. So option opinion four also is talking about the fact that moonlighting will help you leak the critical information not unknowingly, which is definitely unethical. Right. And opinion five says it is okay to moonlight as employers are exploitative and underpay employees. Again, this is supporting moonlighting. So if you observe of the, of the five opinions, the option opinion three and opinion four are the ones that will make him realize that moonlighting is unethical. So let's look at option B. Option B is clearly talking about opinions three and four. So therefore, in that case, opinion B becomes option B becomes my final answer. So that's it from my side guys. So I hope you were able to understand the context of the questions, right? So whenever you are looking at these kind of questions, your job is to understand that you look at the problems objectively, right? And then start resolving the problems, right? Before we end up here, please like, subscribe to our channel and like this video and also comment on the comment section in case you need any more videos from our end. Till then, all the best guys. Take care.